to those of you who are just joining us uh, for part two of Shimmering, Shining, Vomiting, Glitter, or as perhaps we should be calling it now, Shimmering, Shining, Vomiting, Glittier, um, which is just fantastic. Uh, so we had some really wonderful papers this morning from uh, Chon, Elizabeth and Craig, and those three speakers will be joining us at the end of this session along with the next three speakers for a sort of joint uh, collective conversation and panel. So if you do still have questions for those speakers, do uh, kind of save them up in the back of your minds. I know some of you uh, wanted to ask things and didn't quite have time, so we'll be bringing them back in a bit. Uh, for the moment, uh, it's my pleasure, or maybe I should introduce myself first. My name's Lucy Bradnock. I'm a lecturer in art history at the University of Nottingham, and it's been a great pleasure to co-convene this conference with Isabel Whiteleg and the team here at Nottingham Contemporary. And in many ways, this conference is a kind of wish list of scholars working on discussed and related practices, both in the visual arts, but also in literature and in the social sphere, so bringing together lots of wonderful interdisciplinary themes. It's my great pleasure to introduce our next two spe uh, three speakers, sorry, can't count today, um, Katie Jones, Harriet Curtis, and Wayne Burrows, who will be joining us uh, for session two. Katie Jones is a lecturer in French at the University of Nottingham and is author of the recently published Representing Repulsion, the Aesthetics of Disgust in Post-1990 Women's Writing in French and German, a book that's already been referenced by one of our speakers today. Um, our second speaker, Harriet Curtis, is a PhD candidate in the Department of Drama at Queen Mary University of London, where she is focusing on the performances of Paul McCarthy and the ways in which his work draws disciplinary connections between performance studies and art history. And our third speaker this afternoon, Wayne Burrows, is a writer based at Primary Studios here in Nottingham. Recent publications are Spirit Wrapping, some notes on the Rashley Jackson family collection from 2012, Marine, a story in eight objects from earlier this year, and the forthcoming cycle of songs from the body's interior, which is set to be published uh, next year in 2014. So in a moment, um, I'll ask our speakers uh, one by one to join us to give their presentations. And as this morning, we'll have time afterwards, hopefully, for uh, one or two questions. But again, they'll be coming back at the end of all three papers so that we can uh, have more extensive discussions. Just before I uh, ask Katie to come and join us, um, just a few kind of housekeeping reminders. As before, please make sure that your mobile phones are either off or set to silent, though you are, of course, encouraged to live tweet uh, the conference using the hashtag disgust. So I'm sure that those tweets will join a whole kind of realm of uh, Twitter conversations on other related themes. Um, once again, if you don't get connection here, the Wi-Fi uh, username and password are both guessed. Uh, with a lowercase g. Um, so I think we'll kind of crack straight on um, and I'll invite Katie Jones, our first speaker, uh, to join us. Firstly, thank you very much to Isabel and Lucy for inviting me. Um, I'm a literary critic and so I like to talk about uh, disgusting books and my paper's going to look at three examples of disgusting women's writing and think about some of the ways that disgust is being presented in them. But first, it seems important to talk about, discuss more broadly, what I take it to be exactly for my purposes and what it has to do with representation and fiction in particular. So the first part of my talk is going to be it focused on defining disgust, and in the second part, I'll turn to some literary examples um, in recent novels by Amélie Nautomb, Marie Dariussec, and Charlotte Roach. This paper and my interest in disgust it comes out of the book I've been working on about the representation of disgust and the disgusting in contemporary women's writing in French and German, as, as Lucy said. And I started looking at this simply because there seemed to be so much of it around, and it seemed worth considering why. But this meant that the question of what links women writers in particular with disgust, or what disgust has to do with women and their self-representation, or why consider women's writing in terms of disgust at all, is one that's come up in various formulations throughout the course of my research. But whereas this question um, was initially for me based simply on a need to justify the premises of my own project, 
it eventually came to me to feel like a more significant question about the way that women's writing and women's bodies, um, and women's writing about bodies, are positioned in contemporary culture. And so something I want to touch on in the paper is not just the ways in which um, women present bodies of any kind as being disgusting, um, but also the ways in which these presentations are packaged and read and interpreted by others. Um, this seems to me to tie in quite neatly with some of the themes of the exhibition, also the conference. Um, after all, it's the two-way interaction between the artist, writer or activist on the one hand and the spectator, reader or whole society on the other that gives disgust its political force and which also, in my view, makes it rather ambiguous as a tool for kind of specifically directed critique. So with all of this in mind, what I want to do today is to frame some questions that I think are interesting about the critical potential of disgust here related to gender politics, rather than necessarily answering them. Um, what I'm interested in is thinking through the connection between disgust and how it works, and especially how it works in literary representation, but also how that relates to women writers, uh, both in their literary practice and its reception. I've chosen three texts that all present quite complex interconnected economies of disgust, in which disgust at women's bodies features as one element, but which do also all differently address the gendered dimension of disgust in some potentially critical ways. Um, and although I'm not going to have time to analyse them all in detail, I've picked out some key examples that I think, taken together, shed some light on my key central questions. Firstly, though, as I've said, I want to offer a brief definition of disgust and why it lends itself to representation in literature. Um, so I'm very, I, I was very pleased to see that Elizabeth offered us a very evocative account of the kind of slimy and putrefaction type elements of disgust, because I'm not really going to talk about those now. Um, what I want to focus on instead is um, the importance of framing and context and interpretation and communicative function of disgust, which is, I think, why it works so well in narrative. The first thing to note to me is that disgust initially seems very obvious, and we've heard about the kind of immediate visceral reaction that we get from it. Um, and I think it's because it's so closely linked to the senses and to physical sensations um, more so than any other emotion. We all feel disgust, and so we recognize it when we feel it, and that makes it seem reliable. We tend to judge things we find disgusting as being intrinsically so, and therefore not worth valuing, or even somehow morally in the wrong. So um, we recognise disgust in other people as well, and um, this is a, a beautiful simulation of the disgust face in Darwin's expression of the emotions in man and animals from 1872. What I particularly like about this image is the way that Darwin um, describes Mr. Rylander's efforts. He can be seen here simulating the dust ex disgust expression with some success. Um, and the reason that I'm including this image from Darwin's book on emotions is that even though disgust may feel like an instinctive recoil, Darwin considers it to be one of the basic human emotions. Um, that is, emotions that are universally recognized and felt by all humans across all cultures. Um, and indeed it features on all other lists of basic emotions, um, whoever has produced them. And that means that it's more complex than a simple bodily reflex. Animals don't feel disgust, and neither do babies. Humans acquire it around the age of two, and the disgust face um, simulated or produced spontaneously by parents at the site of their offspring's toilet productions, for example, um, is part of the socialization process by which children learn which things are to be rejected as disgusting. Um, I think, in fact, there's a stage at which, um, if anybody's got small children, um, toddlers can be seen to become obsessed with making sure that none of the different kinds of foods on their plates are touching each other. Um, and this is around the time that they acquire disgust. Um, in fact, we have a tendency to assume, especially in English-speaking countries, that um, disgust must have something to do with food for etymological reasons, linking it in English and French with dégoût, um, to the idea of something that tastes bad. But even though food is an obvious candidate for something that can be disgusting, other obviously disgusting things, such as excrement, don't have that much to do with eating, at least not immediately. Um, and other languages, such as German with ekel and um, Spanish, asco, don't make this etymological link to um, taste and eating at all. I believe, in fact, that disgust only acquires its current meaning in English at a point when the notion of taste um, 
had already become an aesthetic rather than just a food-based category. Um, the word disgusto does exist in Spanish, but it's a false friend and doesn't mean, um, doesn't mean the same thing or cover the same physical, aesthetic and moral domains as asco. And indeed, the physical and moral domains taken together um, show that although some things are more likely to disgust than others, disgust has a much broader field of operation than simply unpalatable food, excrement and decay. Um, These terms are broadly equivalent in all of these languages, and all of them, and in other languages, um, there is always a term which incorporates both physical and moral dimensions to disgust. Also, because disgust elicitors vary across cultures, it could be argued that nothing at all is intrinsically disgusting, not even excrement, um, but that anything can be disgusting and become so by processes of association and imagination. So, some work by um, a, psycholo uh, a clinical psychologist called Paul Rosen and, and his colleagues explains this in terms of concepts of sympathetic magic. Um, that is, in order to feel disgust, we need complex concepts of firstly contagion, whereby invisible particles of disgustingness might rub off on us if we come into too close contact with anything disgusting at all. And they did um, some experiments to back this up. So, for example, North American college students consistently refused to drink a favourite drink that had been stirred with a brand new comb, um, feeling that it had become contaminated, or to drink a glass of water that they had themselves only just spat into. They also rejected clean second-hand clothing if they were told that it had previously belonged to a tramp. Um, the second sympathetic magic concept is similarity, uh, whereby if two things look the same, we feel that they must be the same in other ways too, and this is where the image becomes relevant. This is in fact a chocolate dog turd. Um, one experiment carried out by Rosin's team found that subjects would not eat chocolate shaped like a turd, even though they knew it was chocolate. Um, fascinatingly, Rosin and his colleagues also found that the physical properties of the potential disgust elicitor were less important than the interpretation of it. So subjects given an identical substance to smell reported finding it pleasant when they were told that it was cheese and disgusting uh, when they were told that it was excrement. In the write-up um, that was published, uh, Rosin notes that... Um, the smells are confusable in real life, uh, but he doesn't tell us what the substance actually was. So, clearly, interpretation is, is central to the discussed response. And another example of the importance of, of context is um, one of my favourite quotations from an essay by the psychoanalyst Andras Angel, writing in the Journal of Abnormal and Social Psychology in 1941. He writes... I was walking through a field and passed by a shack from which a strong odour, which I took for that of some decaying dead animal, penetrated my nostrils. My first reaction was that of an intense disgust. In the next moment, I discovered that I had made a mistake and recognised the odour as that of glue. The feeling of disgust immediately disappeared and the odour now seemed quite agreeable, probably because of some rather pleasant associations with carpentry. So what I find really interesting here is that the glue was um, most likely made of boiled animal cartilage anyway. So whereas Rosin's cheese and excrement are entirely different substances, um, Angel's are actually pretty similar, just differently labelled in his mind. So disgust turns out to be more complex than it first appears, re relying on complicated magical thinking and an element of interpretation that means that things can be disgusting or not, depending on how they are conceptualised. Uh, furthermore, and here is Cole and I again, briefly. Um, what feels like an instinctive, immediate recoil is often accompanied by a sort of fascination um, with the thing that disgusts us. So, according to Kolnai, this is because, as Elizabeth noted earlier, whereas fear is based on the fact that the terrifying thing exists at all and is dangerous, um, disgust is based instead on what the disgusting thing is like. We're interested in its properties, therefore it has a macabre allure. 
So, writing in 20, 1929, Cole and I described disgust as an aesthetic emotion, um, not necessarily in the sense of artistic representation, but rather in a phenomenological sense. Part of the experience of disgust is this interest in the object's properties. He adds that um, we shun what is disgusting only because otherwise we should take hold of it, something which must not happen. This suggests actually that the fascination stems from our suspicion that we're already a little bit too close to the thing that disgusts us. It's a bit too similar to us and if we touch it then our disgustingness will be revealed. And it partly also explains why perhaps food and excrement are so closely associated with disgust as well. While excrement has been part of us and must now be rejected as separate, a disgusting food poses a very real risk that we might put it in our mouths. Um, we can imagine it becoming incorporated into us much more vividly than a neutral inorganic substance. Sand, for instance, is never found disgusting. The sense of horror that I get from Cole Nye's must not happen um, also expresses something about the strength of the emotion and its importance to our psyche. I've said that disgust is a basic human emotion shaped and mediated by culture. Contemporary theorists also agree that it has important cultural and individual psychological functions, so we need it. Um, I also said that animals didn't feel disgust, but I couldn't really resist this picture of a cat who seems to disagree with that. Um, so, on an individual level, we need disgust to protect us from getting too close to an awareness of our own mortality. Um, and this is another point of general agreement. Um, we reject things like excrement and anything rotten, according to psychologists, because they remind us too viscerally of the fact that we too are animals. Animals don't feel disgust, we use disgust to separate us from reminders of our animality and our own mortality. We're going to die and we're going to rot and we don't want to think about that. Um, and so we kind of need that as a psychological safeguard. But on a social level, disgust can take on a moralised function, helping us to define social boundaries and tell us who we think we are as a group. And I think this is where it can become kind of dangerous and an area to be contested as well. Um, because, of course, all of the things that we think don't belong to our sense of self as a group um, are things or people that can be labelled as disgusting as the objects of our physical disgust. So even though disgust seems necessary and useful in some senses, if I turn now to the representation of aspects of women's bodies as disgusting, it's clear that the socially normative role of disgust can also be damaging in some ways. And the designation within cultures of particular things or particular people or parts of people or their bodies um, as disgusting needs to be challenged. All of the features of disgust, oh, and here is um, Mr. Rylander again, um, just briefly, because you can see the social function of disgust in action very clearly here. Um, because things aren't intrinsically disgusting, as I've said, um, it means that we need a way of signalling to other people that we feel disgust and persuading them to feel it as well. So the role of persuasion and imagination, as well as the cultural variability of disgust elicitors, um, yet with a significant overlap across cultures, all feed into the representation of the female body as a particular focus of disgust. Um, in his book on disgust um, from 1999, Winfried Menninghaus devotes some space to tracing the figure of the ugly old woman um, throughout culture. Um, who's often also presented as sexually voracious, and it's an image that crystallises, according to Menninghaus, all of the main physically disgusting characteristics of all the things we find disgusting into one um, horrific image. Um, a fear of ageing and death, a fear of women's bodies and fertility. But what I want to kind of focus on now is just one specifically female object of disgust, um, menstrual blood, because it features in my literary examples too. And it's traditionally been associated with the disgusting property of contagion and this um, since antiquity. So I have a quotation from uh, Pliny the Elder claiming that nothing is more loathsome or disgusting than a woman's menstrual fluid. 
It's also interesting to me because it's an aspect of women's bodies that they often themselves consider disgusting. Um, as this quotation from Jermaine Greer's um, The Female Eunuch suggests, um, this is in 1971, if you think you are emancipated, Greer writes, you might consider the idea of tasting your menstrual blood. If it makes you sick, you have a long way to go, baby. Um, as a brief aside, I went to a conference on women's writing a couple of years ago where there was a round table discussion on representations of menstruation and um, extracts of texts, including this passage from Greer and also um, from the novel by Charlotte Roach that I'm going to talk about, um, were provided to spark discussion. It was quite a small, intimate conference and, and quite productive. Um, and most of the delegates were young women um, in their 20s, early 20s to late 30s. And something that actually surprised me quite a lot was how many, especially of the younger women, were genuinely disgusted at the idea of tasting their own menstrual blood. Um, and said so as though it were the only obvious reaction. Um, so perhaps we've still got a, a long way to go um, in Greer's terms, but it does help to explain, I think, why um, authors like Charlotte Roach can exploit disgusting imagery so effectively. In the early 70s, then, Greer was challenging the idea that women's bodies are disgusting by simply refuting it. However, I think, looking at the ASCO exhibition and, and listening to the papers this morning, I think it's already clear that at the same period um, and since, a much more nuanced engagement with value-laden social judgments of disgust, which play with its ambiguous and culturally constructed properties, are also going on. Um, so rather than just buying into the notion that some things are disgusting and others just aren't and there's all there is to it, I think that something more complicated um, can come out of the use of disgust for critique. Um, so what I want to suggest now by moving on to my second part on literary examples is that simply denying disgust isn't what the authors that I'm interested in are doing. Rather, they're engaging with female disgustingness in some slightly more subtle and subversive ways. My first literary example is Emily Nouton's uh, debut novel, um, Hygiene and the Assassin, uh, first published as Hygiene de l'Assassin in 1992. And what's interesting in terms of the plot structure is that the object of disgust upon which the whole plot of the novel hinges is actually menstrual blood. Um, so it's a stereotypically female source of disgust. Women's bodies are disgusting, but this doesn't become evident until about three quarters of the way through, when a whole backdrop of various disgusting bodily characteristics and processes has already been established. The novel focuses on a male protagonist, a cantankerous Nobel Prize winning author named Prita Tak, who is dying from a rare form of cancer and allows a series of journalists to interview him. The text is divided into a series of interviews then. The first four with male journalists take about the first half of the novel, and then finally an interview with a female journalist uh, named Nina makes up the second half. The interviews could more accurately be described as a series of verbal duels, so Tack is himself exaggeratedly disgusting, he's grotesquely fat, smelly, re morally reprehensible, and he uses disgust as a weapon to intimidate and get the better of the interviewers and everybody else he comes into contact with. He does this via his own physical qualities, firstly, for instance, deliberately eating garlic and smoking cigars in order to stink as much as possible when his nurse comes to wash him. But he also uses language and rhetoric as a means to interpret and direct disgust and its effects for example, when describing his favourite meal to a journalist who is forced by the description to rush outside and vomit in the street. Um, so I'm quoting it because um, I want to see if I can have that effect on any of you. Uh, Tack says, I drink a very fatty bouillon prepared ahead of time. For hours I boil cheese rind, pig's trotters, chicken rumps, marrow bones and a carrot. Um, I add a ladle full of lard, remove the carrot and let it cool for 24 hours. In fact, I like to drink the bouillon when it's cold, when the fat has hardened into a crust that leaves my lips glistening. But don't worry, I don't waste a thing. Don't go thinking that I throw out all that delicate meat after I've boiled it for a long time. The meat gains in unctuousness, what it's lost in juice. The chicken rumps are a real treat. The yellow fat takes on a lovely, spongy texture. What is the matter? Here, 
the power of language and imagery is presented as capable of producing real disgust, even in the absence of the disgusting broth. The reader might not respond with actual vomiting as the journalist does in the text, um, but might feel a little queasy in sympathy. So the male protagonist, Tack, then is able to exploit his disgusting qualities. Disgust becomes a weapon to be used against others. But the disgust provoked in him by a woman, in this case his adolescent cousin, does not similarly empower her within the text. In the second part of the novel, the female journalist, Nina, has discovered that Tack's only unfinished novel is actually autobiographical and that after a pre-adolescent incestuous love affair with his cousin Leopoldine, the young attack had murdered her in disgust at the onset of her first period. The cousins um, in the episode recounted in this intradiegetic novel are swimming in an icy cold lake when Leopoldine, presented by Tack as an ideally beautiful asexual child, begins menstruating for the first time, and Nina here cuts short his long-winded narration of this horrific Fatag event. In short, says Nina, it was blood. How crude you are, he replies. Your cousin quite simply had gotten her period for the first time. You're disgusting. There's nothing disgusting about it, Nina replies. It's normal. Precisely. Tack replies. So, it's interesting to note here that this, rather than the slow build-up culminating in vomiting, as in the previous example, here the fact of menstruation is simply labelled as disgusting, as though this were an obvious response. Nina seems to be taking Greer's position by simply refusing to consider something normal to be disgusting. But Tack goes on to explain his position, citing the meaning of the blood as part of its disgustingness. No, it was unacceptable. The source of such repulsive effusion could not lie between those legs. Repulsive? Repulsive, I insist. Repulsive because of what it was, and even more so because of what it signified. A terrible rite, a passage from mythical life to cyclical life. Um, in other words, um, procreation, fecundity. Tax discussed at female fertility, and menstruation in particular, is challenged by the presence of Nina, and we're not invited to endorse it, but I would argue we are invited to recognise it. Unlike the detailed and often comical depictions of Tech's disgusting body and the greasy foods he consumes, there's almost no need to explain what's disgusting about the menstrual blood. Tech's account focuses on what disgusts him in its symbolic meanings, not its physical properties. We take those for granted. And while Nina points out that the blood itself is merely normal, the value system that makes Tack reject it as disgusting is not as robustly challenged. Indeed, in terms of the combative dialogue, Tack's interpretation of the blood as disgusting because of what it symbolises is presented as more convincing because he's given more space to develop it. In my second text, um, disgust at female sexuality is also central, but it's used much more overtly as a means to criticise the whole of the social organisation that surrounds it. Um, so this is Marie Dariusek's Pig Tales, which was first published as Truisme in 1996. Um, and this image is from a stage version of the novel. It's a grotesquely fantastic tale of a woman working as a poorly paid prostitute, although she doesn't quite realise it, in a dystopian near future France, who finds herself transforming into a pig against a backdrop of increasing political upheaval, racism, misogyny and religious extremism. So it seems that society kind of metamorphoses around the same time she does. Her body as a sexually active woman and as a pig, um, and especially as something ambiguously in between fluctuating states, is the key focal point of disgust for other characters and sometimes also for the reader. But what perhaps should be a target for moral disgust in the text is the exploitation of women, such as the narrator, in the dystopian society that's depicted, um, and the political landscape leading to extreme racism, the normalisation of rape and sexual violence, and public acceptance of and complicity with this system. And that includes the narrator as well, who becomes an object of moral disgust because she doesn't herself criticise the society 
um, that she describes. As in um, Hygiene and the Assassin, then, disgust at the woman's body is set up, up against a backdrop of other disgusting things and behaviours. I read the narrator's multiple transformations between her human and porcine states as an almost instinctive expression of disgust, and this is supported in the book by her visceral recognition of a character who has previously treated her badly um, via, and I quote, a surge of revulsion. Though she hasn't previously expressed disgust towards him when narrating his actions. This also reflects theorizations of disgust, such as the recent account by Carolyn Korsmeyer in Savouring Disgust, who considers disgusting art to be valuable because she claims the experience of disgust offers us access to kinds of truths about ourselves and reality which we might not otherwise have. So the instinctive recoil of disgust then gives us access to knowledge that we couldn't otherwise access. The narrator of pigtails, uh, pictured here, could thus be seen as experiencing a somatic reaction to a morally disgusting society, which then leads her, finally, to recognise that society as repugnant to her. But this is made much more complex by the fact that she is also, in some senses, an object of disgust herself, not just to the people around her, but potentially also to readers and critics. For me, as I've said, she's an object of moral disgust because of her naivety, her unreliability as a narrator, the way that she colludes with the system and doesn't condemn behaviour that the implied reader is likely to find unacceptable, such as the brutal rape and murder of very young men and women and the slaughter of inmates at a mental hospital. However, um, my example from the text is one that I would read very differently to one critic, Patricia Ferramedina, who cited this extract describing the protagonist's enlarged vulva as a key example of something which was most likely to disgust the, this is a quotation, the imaginative reader will be disgusted by this. Um, the narrator and her boyfriend have gone to um, a leisure centre where they're having sex in um, one of the changing cubicles. This is standard practice. Um, She's more or less in pig form here, and Honoré is not very attracted to her anymore, but he's making an effort. Um, in the cubicle, Honoré managed to rise to the occasion and sodomise me. I think he couldn't bear even to think about my vagina anymore. As for me, bending forward, I had what you might call an unparalleled view of my vulva, and I thought it was dangling rather strangely. I don't want to burden you with details, but the greater labia were hanging down a mite lower than normal, which is why I could see them so well. In Woman's World, or My Beauty, My Health, I don't remember exactly, I'd read that the ancient Romans' favourite and choicest dish was stuffed sow's vulva. The magazine had railed against a culinary practice that was both macho and cruel to animals. I took no sides on the subject, never having had any particularly firm opinions on politics. Honoré finished. We left the cubicle. So, this is the most disgusting part for Ferre Medina, and it struck me as a surprising thing, example to single out as being the most disgusting in a text with no shortage of trailing entrails and animal-human sex scenes, uh, especially as the narrator's apologies and omissions, which I've underlined um, on the slide, suggest that she's not supposed to be taken as reliable. She's ostensibly writing her story for a reader who shares her cultural values, and the you uh, addressed here is not the real reader. Rather, it's a reader from the society presented in the novel, one who squeamishly turns away from descriptions of women's bodies and their sexual desires um, and doesn't want to be burdened with details, but who considers the exploitation of women and the mistreatment of other marginalised groups to be normal. She doesn't apologise when she talks about those. So Pigtails is a very complicated and interesting text, and there's much more to it than disgusting bodies, um, which I don't have time to go into now. But what struck me in this particular review, wherever the question of the disgusting body arose, and also when I've taught the text to undergraduate students, is the way that the initial yuck response to descriptions of enlarged vulvas, hairy backs, menstrual blood, and so on, um, can sometimes seem to neutralise the critical di distance that the text nonetheless also invites through its mode of narration. This tendency is even more noticeable in some of the reception of my third example, Charlotte Roach's debut novel, Wetlands, published in German as Feuchtgebiete in 2008. 
This is perhaps because the female body in wetlands is the central focus of the text rather than also serving as a metaphor for a political system, as in pigtails. The plot, such as it is, is rather sketchy. The narrator, an 18-year-old girl named Helen Mimmel, is in hospital with an inflamed sphincter wound um, after an intimate shaving accident. And she entertains herself while she's there with reflections on her family life, but mainly on her sexual experimentation. Because Helen rejects disgust altogether, claiming that if you find Cox, Cum or Smegma disgusting, you might as well forget about sex, the novel might initially seem to be a simple revaluation of the female body, a kind of anti-disgust manifesto in the style of Greer's challenge to her female readership in the 1970s. Helen's fascination with her own body and all of its processes and her pleasure in um, sexual experiments, uh, for instance, she describes in detail and with relish how she cleans out her intestines before anal sex, um, how she makes her own tampons and fishes them out with barbecue tongs if she loses them, um, and how she saves the dried up sperm from sex under her fingernails to eat later, um, run counter to the cultural presentation of disgust. But a closer reading reveals that if Helen is unaware of the mechanisms of disgust, denying the possibility of contagion, for example, as she does not believe, I think it's an image of how she likes to kind of wipe herself all over the toilet seat every time she uses a public toilet in a kind of effort to refute the idea that you can catch anything. Um, Roach, on the other hand, as the author, knows precisely how to exploit the mechanisms of disgust to encourage her reader to feel it when her character does not. And if we linger briefly on the example of the dried up sperm, um, here it is. When I jerk somebody off, I always make sure that some cum gets on my hand, says Helen. I run my fingers through it and let it dry under my long nails. That way, later in the day, I can reminisce about my good fuck partner by biting my nails and getting bits of the hardened cum to play with in my mouth. I chew on it and, after tasting it and letting it slowly dissolve, I swallow it. It's an invention I'm very proud of, the memorable sex bonbon. So what we can see, actually, is that although Helen presents herself as totally undisgustable um, and denies the power of magical thinking, she still attaches a great deal of importance to the meaning of bodily secretions. Similarly, she enjoys eating her own bodily productions too, but her, thought, her delight at the thought of eating pus, scabs and the crusty residue from her eyes is somewhat disingenuous. Um, as it's inconsistent with her insistence on pleasure in physical sensations rather than what they represent. After all, even if these things taste good, which I consider questionable, maybe a bit salty, uh, they could hardly be produced in large enough quantities for the flavour to be really apparent. And outside of the fictional world narrated by Helen, the author Charlotte Roach is clearly well aware of her text's potential to disgust others. So rather than simply replacing disgust at female sexuality with a reversal in the form of pride rhetoric, Roach's novel ultimately appears as a much more subtle engagement with disgust in its cultural construction. We're invited to feel disgust at the same time as we join Helen in questioning its validity. I want to finish this analysis with a quotation that doesn't strike me as particularly disgusting at all, um, but which forms part of Helen's ongoing bodily experimentation. I've experimented with long periods of not washing my pussy. My aim is to get its enticing scent to waft lightly out of my pants, even through thick jeans or ski pants. In a review of Wetlands, Andrea Ritter, who otherwise endorsed the novel as being a feminist text, identified this particular example as among the most disgusting. As with the enlarged vulva that disgusted Ferra Medina in Pigtails, this particular example is not one that sets off any of my disgust triggers, yet also seems to disgust even female critics simply because it's a reference to the prominence of the female genitals. Drawing all of this together then, I'd argue that all three novels are broadly critical of presentations of the female bodies intrinsically disgusting, um, but they do also reproduce these kinds of cultural representations to a certain extent. Um, and the way that they tend to disgust other critics, and even female and feminist ones, um, seems to me to be because they all depend upon the recognition and, to a certain extent, the acceptance 
of certain things as being disgusting for their effects to work. Whether or not readers really are disgusted by menstruation, extremes of fleshy fecundity, or the yellowish stains on a pair of dirty knickers, they must at least acknowledge these things as plausible objects for disgust for the metaphorical uses to which they are put to work. But disgust is slippery and contaminating, as we've seen, and once these images of women are presented as disgusting, the critical response of readers might be less easy to direct. A parallel can be seen in the visual arts um, in the work of the Scottish painter Jenny Savile. Um, according to Michelle Ma, Savile's large canvases of exaggeratedly fleshy female forms, such as Propped from 1992, invite the viewer to interrogate her own feelings of disgust and self-disgust, and um, thus invite reflection on the misogynistic labelling of certain kinds of female bodies as acceptable or unacceptable. Savile's paintings are disturbing in a way that Ma argues a more simplistic rhetoric of fat pride is not. But as convincing as I find her analysis, the fact remains that viewer responses are extremely hard to predict. Um, as she notes in, in her article, some people find the paintings up problematically beautiful and do see in them a straightforward revaluation re of female curves. Um, so if the image is not recognised as disgusting, it cannot perform the complex work of interrogating disgust. Returning to the literary texts, I would suggest that by contrast with visual representations, narrative fiction potentially offers more scope to direct readers' disgust, because although it lacks the central immediacy of a visual image, um, it allows the interpretative, interpretative framework to be more fully developed. To conclude, I think that all of the works I have discussed do manage to challenge assumptions about female disgustingness, but that this is more complex than any kind of rejection or revaluation. That is, it's not just a female pride movement aimed at revaluing women's bodies positively, nor is it just an attempt to shock using images of disgust. And these are two ways in which Roach's work in particular has been widely received. Um, and also why I used the tampon earring picture earlier, courtesy of tamponcrafts.com. Um, where you can find many other um, craft projects to do with tampons, um, which seems to be trying to do both of those things at once, I think. What I've tried to show instead, though, is that by taking up images of disgusting femininity and placing them within a larger system of interconnected and competing disgusts, the text can be read from a feminist critical perspective as both situated in and subverting a culture in which women's bodies are still seen as particularly disgusting or disgusting in particular ways. The disgusting is therefore being used to engage readers emotionally and viscerally with literary texts, and also to offer a more ambivalent critical approach to aspects of women's experience, which have tended to be presented positively in attempts to revalue them, as in, for example, Eve Ensler's vagina monologues. So, as well as challenging misogynistic stereotypes about disgusting female sexuality, women writers are also able to exploit this same cultural tradition of disgust and self-disgust for a range of critical purposes, and, I would argue, in ways which are much more nuanced than the responses of reviewers and critics, such as those I've cited, um, sometimes allows for. Thank you. Thank you for that, Katie. Um, what's my question? <laughs> the, the body's back, I get that. The body's back in a way, it, it went out of fashion after the 80s, I think. Um, I'm wondering to what extent the body's been brought back in at the cost of a more social um, and socialist, perhaps, um, agenda. And kind of tangential to that, do you think that people like Kathy Acker, who is very much kind of the, 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 the mother of these, these writers you're, you're talking about, um, why has she gone out of fashion? It, it, it just seems that these, these, these things are not purely kind of random, that, that there is a certain sort of um, political dimension which I, I've yet to unpack myself. I just wondered what, 
your thoughts on that were? Um, I think that's quite a lot of questions all at once, really. I mean, partly because the writers that I'm looking at are so different, then there would be different answers for all of them. To take um, Roach um, as one example, I think she is interesting because she directs her work very much towards a younger audience. And I think that one of the issues that I have when um, teaching this kind of literature to undergraduates is that they don't know anything that happened um, in the 70s and 80s, so this is all new to them. And I think that's the kind of audience that Roach is targeting. But at the same time, um, Roach also tries to reject um, what she sees as kind of earlier generations of kind of feminist representations of bodies, um, and she's trying to claim that she's doing something different um, to that, which in some senses she is, but in some senses she could be seen as a continuation, as you say, of something that never really went away. So I think it's partly a question of branding and packaging. It's um, kind of women's bodies for a new generation presented slightly more fashionably. Um, and in another sense, I think there are new things going on here because I think there's a lot more nuance to this work than even kind of Roach allows for in the way that she kind of markets it um, to people. The film version actually was criticised for getting rid of all the disgust and so I think that's very much a sort of, it's just a film about a liberated woman being a bit sexy and it kind of takes out all of the complexity um, that's there in the novel. Um, in terms of the first question to do with um, the body kind of coming back at, at the expense, I think, you said, of a more kind of collective political consciousness. I think that could be true in the ways that some of the writers that I look at present bodies. It's very individualistic and it's very much to do with the kind of individual um, kind of psychological interpretation of one's own body and identity. But, for example, in Mary Daniel's sex text, I think it really is the body as a focal point for talking about a whole society and criticising contemporary society um, in the way that the central female character um, interacts with other people around her, but also in the, the kind of social transformations and political transformations that are taking place around her. And I think that, actually... Um, it's quite critical of the tendency that you mentioned to talk about kind of individual bodies at the expense of society because the narrator is very ignorant of politics. In the bit I cited, she says, I, I never had any opinions on politics. This is something that she says throughout the text. And what's very frustrating for a reader is not knowing what's happening. Um, that she mentions kind of wars and revolutions and different politicians and you have to read between the lines because she's not telling you what's happening and you want to know. And so I think that it's expressing a sense of frustration precisely with that kind of tendency towards being self-centred um, in that way. Um, maybe I'll kind of grab the microphone. Um, Wonderful paper, thank you so much, Katie. Um, I had a kind of question almost about your title sort of refers to revolting women. Mm -hmm. And at the very beginning, I think you almost referred to revolting authors. And I wondered, is there an extent to which in some of the critical responses to these books, and you sort of mentioned a few critics who expressed disgust at maybe, maybe arguably some of the less disgusting passages, is there an extent to which that disgust has been mapped not just onto the narrators of those books, but onto the authors themselves? Um, yes, in some cases. So Roach would be a good example because she's actually a very um, well-known figure in popular culture. She was a, um, I think, she, I can't remember what channel it was on, but she was a, a um, presenter on one of the, the pop music channels and so she was very well known before she started writing and when she wrote this book she claimed that I think 90% of it was autobiographical so she and her publishers encouraged identification between the author and the character in that way um, so I think in that sense she was presented as being disgusting but also as being sort of courageous in talking about disgust um, so it was more kind of, it was a way of assuming disgust I suppose um, in terms of the reception of other writers who, who write about disgusting things, I think Newton was interesting because this was her first novel and she's got a, narrator, a protagonist who is um, a male author who's just won the Nobel Prize and um, 
at the time when it was published, she was completely unknown because this was her first novel and she was 21 years old. Um, and it was widely believed in French literary circles that it wasn't actually written by a young woman at all and people thought that it must be um, an established male author writing under a pseudonym. And this was genuinely believed there was a lot of discussion of who it could be and I think that people had their suspicions as to who it was. And so there was this sense in which it was thought that um, a young woman wouldn't be writing in this way about women or writing something so accomplished at a young age at all. So I think that, I mean, that there have been kind of misogynistic stereotypes in the reception as well, but not necessarily um, always focused on finding the female authors disgusting, but this kind of sense of disbelief, I think, that they'd be doing it at all. Mm. Uh, as to whether these texts are political or not, is there a, a sex battle going on? I mean, is misogyny under uh, attack? Or is this culture shown to be not particularly a battle between male and female? Um, I think, yes, misogyny is definitely under attack. And I mean, especially in, in pigtails where um, it's a kind of there's a whole litany of abuse of men, but I think that it's not just kind of male versus female, but I think all of the texts have this um, kind of sense of recognition of kind of female misogyny as well. So you've got um, female characters who find themselves disgusting or who allow themselves to kind of buy into the cultural codes that present their bodies as disgusting. Um, I suppose in much the same way as the, the young women I encountered um, wouldn't taste their own menstrual blood. Um, but you have... I think Helen in Charlotte Roach's Wetlands is the only character who completely denies all of that, but the text nonetheless still draws attention to it. Um, after all, she's in hospital because of um, an accident while attempting to shave around her sphincter. Um, and I think that Roach herself said that she wanted to attack this kind of culture of um, female bodily hygiene and all the things that um, women were expected to do. Um, Daria Sex text... Um, presents a lot of abusive men and a misogynistic culture and there's hardly any other female characters in it at all um, which could seem quite one-sided but at the same time the central character is this woman who also um, is in total denial about what's going on and who, who um, doesn't particularly support other women or have any kind of other female friendships and I think that it's a way of, of making it more complicated. It's not just this is a feminist text because it says all the men are bad, um, which is, I think, kind of what undergraduate students who read it kind of expect it to be. Um, so I quite like the way that it's presented as being more complex. Um, that was great.